Um, so, sorry, yeah, for those of you that don't know what it is, it's about a, a, a young girl vampire who sparks up a relationship with this boy, this lonely lad who gets picked on and bullied at school, and they form a bond, and it's only as the story progresses that he realises what she is, who she is, how old she is. She has this kind of father figure who it's it's then revealed that they are... they he's they met when they were a similar age at her age and she's just not gotten older he has gotten older um so they're actually they were lovers at one point and now the relationship is kind of like a father-daughter relationship and he's trying to get uh food for her i.e victims humans because she needs to feed on uh blood and he's becoming much older and more uh, frail and he's not able to get her the, the food that she needs and that's kind of where we meet the, the young lad character and and they kind of form a bond so it's really it's really heartwarming it's very violent and bloody and I thought they 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 managed to uh, transport those elements quite well from the screen to the stage There's a lot of great use of blood uh, for example, there's a point where there's going to be spoilers here, by the way. Ah! Just like to keep you on your toes. There's a point where a guy is, um, he's basically strung up by his feet and he cuts his throat and he has to drain the blood and they do that live on stage. That's like one of the first few scenes. There's a lot of gasps in the audience, you know. Um, so very impactful, very well orchestrated the scenes themselves were quite brief and it was in the round the royal exchange is in the round and so it's very challenging i think i prefer uh i think it's called uh thrust or pros proscenium arch i think it's the right terminology basically like end on theater i think when actors are performing in the round it kind of forces them to move unnaturally and they have to sort of cheat everything out. They have to move on every other line. There's a lot of orchestration that happens with the scene changes. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of tricks that have to happen, and you have to really suspend disbelief in terms of where they are, what they're doing. It's it's quite hard to. I like just watching, you know, just a few different sets. Like one scene is in one set, scene change, and then, you know, you let that scene play out and you can really immerse yourself in the world. The actors can immerse themselves in the scene and really find the nuance and the rhythms and talk to each other. Whereas with something like this, taken from the book and the film, the scenes were very, it was really quick. There were a lot of moments that I thought, there were a lot of really nice moments, like the... Um, I thought the relationship between the the young girl and the and the boy, I thought that was lovely. There was some nice um you know, some nice jokes, some humour that came through. But there were also a lot of moments I thought uh, that was a big moment there and you, and it's not it's not kind of landed. For example, the the father character or the, the guardian character, let's call him. Father sounds a bit wrong. But it is. it kind of looks that way when you watch the film. It's like, oh, that's obviously her dad. And then you realise that, oh, she's not... She doesn't age, so that means their relationship... He, there's a real kind of lament there from, from the guardian character to her because it's... And there's a point in the play where she says, do you want me to take this... She's in a nightgown. She's like, do you want me to take this off? And he's like, no, no which kind of signposts like she she can't be what he wants and he and you know there's that real uh yeah lament there it's quite sad and, and bittersweet in that way um so the guy who played that character he he felt to me like he felt a bit young and he felt a bit too he looked too well he looked too strong because the whole point of that element of the story is that this guy is too old to look out for her to get, you know, to to uh, overpower these people to get blood from them. So I thought that was, you know, maybe 
a bit of miscasting there. He could have been much older and you would have maybe bought into that a bit more. Um, and yeah, just the odd moment here or there that I thought that's not been, um, that's not been bedded in properly or that should have been given more space. For example, when the father character, he says, um, the guardian character, sorry, he says, he, he, at one point he pours acid on his face because it's like a, um, a sort of, I don't know, a bit of a kamikaze move. If the shit hits the fan to protect her, he's pour, he's going to pour acid on himself so he can't be recognized and can't, and she can't be traced. So he's doing it to protect her. And there's a point in the play where this just comes out of nowhere and he pulls out this, this kind of container of acid and says, basically explains what he's going to do with it and like this is how I prove my love to you and then it's and then the moment's gone it's literally like I was like uh, nah <laughs> no no go back to that that's fucking huge um I'm nitpicking obviously because I, I wasn't expecting to enjoy it as much as I did I, I just thought well I've seen so many adaptations from films that are just sort of uh, very, they just don't translate. I remember watching The Exorcist at the Opera House. It was fucking abysmal. It was one of the worst plays I've ever seen. It was so bad. It was none of it, it the, the acting was lazy, I thought. I just, it wasn't believable. Um, I think maybe a large part of it was to do with the, the audience, <laughs> the audience just with the, um, it was like they were watching a panto or something to it. Like people would like, like, get, you know, eating sweets and getting up, going back and forth to the toilet, coughing, like incessant coughing. I know that sounds a bit fascistic, maybe or a bit elitist me saying that, but you're trying to watch it like a horror. And it, that was end on theater. That was, you know, and I was trying to just, just cling on to some sort of, I want to invest, let me invest. Uh, so, uh, and the, the play itself just wasn't very good. It wasn't well directed. And there's no excuse for something like that. I th um, Sarah Frankham directed this, who's been going for years now. Um, and, and there were, like I said, there were a few moments where I thought that's not, uh, another example is when the, the girl is luring, uh, a homeless person towards her so she can basically attack him. And she's, it's in the film. I think I showed it on yesterday's stream or whenever it was. And she's kind of, in the film, she's curled up and she's sobbing. It's like, she's really in distress. Uh, and the, and the homeless guy is very wary. And it, but he comes over to her and then she switches and jumps on him and, and basically chews his neck off and it's horrific and it's it, it scares you and it comes out of nowhere and it's animalistic but in this, in the play version she was just sort of um, like she was just having to lie down and it was all very brightly lit uh, and the homeless guy was just very um, it just wasn't it, it just wasn't believable I didn't buy it at all. She wasn't crying. She wasn't in distress. She was just talking like she was a bit upset. Um, whereas if I would have been directing that, I would have said, you need to invest more in this. Uh, you, you're massively in distress, you know? And she could, it's not like the actor couldn't go there because there were a lot of moments later on where um, she, she did get to those points of, you know, real high octane emotion. But that one of those moments was not um, that that just didn't land for me. The reason I mentioned that is the the Exorcist play was end on, you know there wasn't much, so you could sort of forgive that because there was a lot going on in terms of like we're we're only going to be in this scene for another two like another minute and then we're moving on. So you didn't really linger too much on those things. It just sort of it ticked over, and there were there were much more great moments that overrode any of that. But the the Exorcist was just uh, just kind of one set in this house, and uh, so when the acting isn't good, 
or the writing isn't good, you go, oh, fuck me. Fuck me. Fuck me. It's dead. It's all fucking dead. Oh, fuck off. You, you just, you, you don't forgive it as much. Uh, Woman in Black is a great example of that. You know, very minimal set. And it's all it's all on the actors. It's on the atmosphere. It's on the the um, the timing of these uh, jump scares that happen. Ooh, I just got I got goosebumps just thinking about that. Then I've seen it twice and it shat me up both times. Ugh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the woman in black. If you get a chance to see that on stage, that's a great example of how to uh, less is more. And if you put your focus on the writing and the acting, you can you can uh, very effectively scare the shit out of people if you pace it out well enough. Um, and sort of blurring this line between the audience and the stage. And then the way that starts is all the house lights are up and it's as if the guys are rehearsing something. And then before you know it, the, the, the house lights have sort of faded down and you're you're in and you're invested and you don't you're not sure where that line has been crossed but you're just in there and then you can just sort of feel it slowly closing its hands around you preparing to die oh, i love that um let's have a let's have a quick skim through this um Thorne's scripts, working from both Lindvist's novel and 2008 film, focuses closely on Oscar and Eli, uh, their compelling bond, as played by Pete McHale. Oscar has the vulnerability and unpredictability of a wounded animal. He radiates pain and loneliness that is also an edge to him. A sliver of something dangerous. Rianne blundles. Eli, meanwhile, is a slippery, otherworldly creature. The way Blundell moves across the stage is extraordinary. One moment leaping with supernatural grace. Oh yeah, there's a lovely moment where she does kind of you see her in her like animalistic state, like her most unhuman state. Um Oh, I can't remember what point it's at now. It's kind of like halfway through the play. And this the sound design, the soundtrack and the the uh I wasn't quite sure whether it was something coming through the speakers or whether it was from her, but it was a real, it was animalistic and it was a raw, it was, there was pain in it. There was, uh, there was violence in it. And, uh, I really, really bought that moment. I thought she was, she was really good. They were both great. There's also a moment again, spoiler at the end of the, um, at the end of the film, there's the, the climax of the film is that Oscar, that Oscar and um, Eli go their separate ways. That they there's a there's a there's a uh, a uh, dissolution in their relationship. So you don't think they're ever going to see each other again. And Oscar, who's been bullied by these kids at school, is left in the school swimming pool. The the teacher is taken off. Um, He's basically cornered in this swimming pool with the kids. And there's the brother there's an older brother of this kid who's been bullying him. This kid has got his older brother who's fucking he's he the guy who played him was brilliant because it sort of it ratchets up the whole uh what's the word? The risk, if you like, the uh the um what's the fucking word? Not risk, jeopardy, jeopardy, and uh, the 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 climax of the film is she comes to the rescue, and there's a shot from under. I'll see if I can find it, actually, because it is very good. Um, let's do that. YouTube. Meh. Let the right one. I think there's a series coming out as well. Let the right one in. Uh, swimming pool. Um, what's that? 
that's not you. Oh, yes. Oh, it is you. I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, right, let's just... Yeah. It's a shot from... So the, the older brother, the nut job, is holding the kid underwater and he's kind of playing, he's toying with him basically and, you know, saying uh, he's screwed either way. It's like, if you come up for air, I'm going to cut you, you or you stay under for three minutes and, the, you know, so you think he's done for and then this happens. That's the vampire, Eli, coming back and just tearing shit up. And you go. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very clever, very well shot and very um, innovative. And I c apart from thinking, how the fuck are they going to do that on stage? How are they going to have that same, you know, that same uh, impact? And I thought they did that very well. And the, the guy playing the older brother was very menacing and uh, he carried that. And then, but there was also the way it was staged. They kind of had this uh, uh, dry ice effect on the floor, which was like the bottom of a swimming pool. And they elevated everything so that the kids were stood around the swimming pool. And then a lot of trickery with lights and the, the Eli character popping up and blood going everywhere and all, you know, all kicks off. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that that moment. Go back here. Um, though through though the production is not explicitly set in Lindvist's native Sweden, there's a Scandinavian coolness to Amelia Jankin's design with a few yeah few few clever lighting tricks. Its pale blue and grey tiles transform the school gym to a playground, from a frozen lake to a swimming pool. As one of the Royal Exchange's artistic directors, Sh Shanahan. Shanahan knows how to get the most out of this tricky space using the auditorium's multiple levels to heighten the escalating drama. For horror fans, there are a few genuine scares, but at its heart, this is a tenderly told tale of growing up, forming friendships, and facing the darkness of the world. So yeah, if you get a chance, go and see it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Let the right one in at the, uh, the Royal Exchange in Manchester. Ooh.